catch, I'm throwing in my hat. <laughs> Beautiful. It just gets it just gets better. <laughs> oh good, I did put my pants on. <laughs> I have been a professional angler for most of my adult life. I was a guide, an instructor, and I have my own TV show. I was a member of the Canadian fly fishing team, and I fished on the world championships. Fishing has been my life's passion, except for my husband, Lou, of course. If anyone here is a fisherman, and I do see some familiar faces in the crowd, you know how it feels when you cast your line in the water and hit your mark. One minute, you're enjoying the peace and serenity of nature when all of a sudden, the water explodes. You feel a pull, you pull back. Your adrenaline goes through the roof and you start to shake. As you reel that fish in, no words can describe that feeling. I've never felt more alive, except with my husband, Lou, <laughs> of course. Now this is where it gets tough, because as great as that feeling is, and as much as I know that I will miss it, I have decided to never again cast a line in the water for sport. I'm not here to preach or tell anyone what's right or wrong. This is my personal decision, one that has taken a lot of soul searching. Now, I grew up on the water in Nova Scotia, and I fell in love with fishing the first time I cast my line on the water and pulled out a fish. You know, it seemed like a miracle. I remember how excited I felt and how Back then, sports fishing was a male preserve. I would watch the fishing shows on TV and fantasize about having a show of my own. But the idea seemed so preposterous that I wouldn't even dare say it out loud. And my father, well, he would take my brothers on the fishing trips, but he would never take me. It never even occurred to him. And when I would ask to come along, he'd say, these trips aren't for girls. End of discussion. When I was 30, I decided to go after my dream. I sold my business and went in pursuit of becoming a professional fly fisherman. Now, what I'm about to share with you guys, I've never said out loud before. It has taken me many years to get to this place, and um, it's heartbreaking for me. <laughs> so I'm glad that I'm amongst friends uh, you guys can help me through it, but here we go. I was talking about how when I turned 30, I decided to go after my dream, and I sold my business and um, devoted myself to learning the art of fly fishing. And it was a lot of work. Um, if any of you guys have tried this, uh, it's, you know, the first time I tried it, I lift the fly off the water and I would duck. Uh, but, you know, after a few years, I became the third woman in Canada to be qualified as a certified casting instructor. Uh, yeah, thank you. I worked as a fishing guide for a while, but that was a little tricky, taking men that I didn't know into the wilderness um, when I'd be carrying the toilet paper and the see-through sack and the whole bit, anyway. So after that, um, I started to produce my own TV show. And then I traveled all over the world 
in pursuit of the top game fish. Uh, peacock bass in Brazil, sailfish in Costa Rica, yellowfish in South Africa, thyme in Mongolia, the mighty Mahasir in India, and even a fish that smelled like watermelon and was a vegetarian in Japan. I went fishing every chance I had, and every trip had one primary goal, to catch the trophy fish. Oh yeah, the one that would make people sit up and take notice. There were other satisfactions as well, because my husband would invite me to go on his fishing trips, and I was the only, usually the only woman in the group. And at first the men were aloof and a bit dismissive, but that changed when I showed them that I could fish as well, if not better than they could. And it might sound crass, but I have to admit that I did enjoy seeing the looks on their faces at the end of the day when they found out that I was top rod. <laughs> I took even more pleasure when they would comment on what great fishing buddies Lou and I were and how on the next trip they would invite their wives along. Now, I always saw myself as the fish's ally. I always practiced catch and release and I treated the fish with the utmost care. I practiced with barbless hook to lessen the damage to the fish. I kept the fish in the water for the photo op. And instead of releasing it right away, I would hold on to it until it was ready to swim away under its own power. But despite taking all these protections, I always had this nagging feeling that I was doing something wrong. I might have known that I was going to release the fish, but the fish didn't know that. As far as it was concerned, it was fighting for its life. And seeing the fish struggle and gasp for air did take away a lot of the joy of catching it. You know, my sinking feeling turned out to be more than just women's intuition. In recent years, scientific studies have proven that catch and release isn't as harmless as we've been told. A lot of the fish that are released die within days or weeks of being hooked, and their death isn't a pleasant one. Injuries they suffer from being hooked and released can make it hard for them to eat and make them prone to predation. So this is where things got complicated for me, because I could no longer make another living being suffer just to give me a thrill and to feed my ego. The more I learned, the more conflicted I became. But I wasn't ready to give up fishing. I was too addicted to the thrill of the battle, too in love with that trophy picture. Oh, yes, I was. Too enamored with being part of the fishing fraternity. So, you know, I just kept on fishing and suppressed sinking feeling that I had. So this led to the next stage of my evolution. About 10 years ago, Lou and I established an organization called Casting for Recovery Canada. It's a nonprofit organization that teaches women who have or have had breast cancer how to fly fish. And you know, some of those women didn't want to tie the fly on their hook, on their line. And at first, I thought they were being overly sensitive. But then when I got sick, I started to feel the same way. My illness changed everything about my, my life. Um, I had contracted Lyme disease. It's a serious infection. You guys know about it out here. It's um, caused by a bug bite. And when I got sick, um, the doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. So I'd actually been sick for a long time and it had gone diagnosed and it turned into a potentially life-threatening illness. So suddenly, I had gone from being fearless and adventurous and, um, you know, really, I, I was living the life. Um, and for the first time in my life, I was forced to confront my own mortality. And I started asking myself questions that I hadn't asked since I was, was an adolescent. Uh, you know, like, why was I born? And, and what is the purpose of my life? So despite my illness, I was able to go on a, a few fishing trips, but I realized I had lost the heart for it. 
I could no longer catch a fish for sport. I realized that I could no longer cause another living being to suffer just to give me a thrill and to feed my ego. So I decided to switch things up a little bit, and I went on a trip to Iceland, and I thought, I'm going to try hookless fishing. Have you guys heard of this? Well, I, the guide hadn't heard of it either, but I told him what I was going to do. <laughs> You know, because I was desperate. I wanted to keep fishing. You know, fishing was, it was my whole life. I mean, look, it was my identity. It was how I saw myself and how others saw me. I wasn't ready to give this all up. So, hookless fishing. So I told the guide, if you can picture this, I'm going to cut off the bend of the hook and cast the feathers alone. Well, he didn't laugh, but, you know, not out loud. Not then, but I knew that there'd be plenty of laughter back at the lodge when he told the other guides about the crazy Canadian woman he had just spent the day with. But I had to try. So I picked my fly. I cast my line. It hit its mark. I felt the satisfaction that came with watching the water explode as that fish rose and took the fly. <laughs> Boy, I love that. And even though the rod bend only lasts for a short time, it was incredibly satisfying. And I thought that maybe I had found the way that I could, you know, keep on fishing. And best of all, it wouldn't hurt the fish in any way. How do you think it ended up? No. You see, before, before I got all warm and fuzzy and had my epiphany uh, about this whole fishing thing, my favorite fish was the Atlantic salmon. Now, I'm sort of out west, but, you know, you guys probably are steelheaders out here. But it's kind of the same thing, right? The Atlantic salmon is known, known by sportsmen as the king of fish. And not just because of its beauty, strength, and power. It's because of its incredible journey. This fish is born in freshwater streams, and then it makes its way to the ocean. And when it's ready, it goes to its Arctic feeding grounds. It hangs out there for a while, and when it's ready to breed, it makes the long journey all the way back to the very river where it was born. Now, scientists can't figure out how they can do this, and watching these fish mount these waterfalls to get back to the very place where they were born ranks high on the list of nature's wonders. There's only a small amount of eggs that survive this epic journey, and when these fish return, you can bet that they're tired and they're weary and they need to rest to be able to do what nature has asked of them, and that's to reproduce for the next generation. But not even hookless fishing allows for them to do this. You know, here they are. I mean, you guys, if you've seen a wild fish, right, in, they're floating in air and they're resting in this oxygenated water. And this is after living in salt water. They're back in fresh water. You know, even that their bodies can make this fundamental change, it's extraordinary. But hookless fishing doesn't allow the fish to regain their strength. You know, there they are sitting there when smack, a fly hits the water. Smack, 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 smack. Day after day, week after week, these fish are sleep deprived and harassed. It's tantamount to sleep deprivation and harassment, in my opinion. It's very difficult. I just feel that unless I'm going to take that fish for my own nourishment, that I don't have the right to interfere with its life in any way. I believe that the fish and every living 
thing has its right to live out its life as nature intended. So unless I need that fish for my own sustenance, I don't want to interfere with its life. Now you may think that my views on fish and fishing are extreme, maybe even ridiculous. But consider this. You know, 50 years ago, it was deemed perfectly acceptable to go to Africa and shoot an elephant, or shoot a rhino, or shoot a lion, cut off its tusks, or cut off its head, or take its skin, get a picture with your trophy kill, and then bring it back home. Now today in this room, most of us would find this barbaric. I'm not saying that sports fishing is remotely like big game hunting, but what I am saying is that our views about fish and fishing and animals have evolved from the days when we thought they were here merely for our own benefit. And they will continue to evolve into the future. It used to be that we lived in harmony with nature. But now, because of science, we have learned to exploit nature for our own material needs. And this has created a great problem, in my opinion. We have environmental degradation and issues that are really threatening our very existence. And if we want to save this world for the next generation, we have to do more than just change a few laws. We have to fundamentally change our attitude about our place on this earth and the animals that we share it with. So this is my cry for temperance. I beg temperance. You know, I'm not here to moralize. Gandhi said it best. The greatness of a society and its moral progress, he said, can be measured by the way they treat its animals. Devolve. That's an idea we're sharing. God bless. Thanks.